This video is sponsored by Endo. In the early 1950s, an impossible aircraft took to the sky. An interceptor like no other that could be deployed from submarines, take off from the sea itself and go supersonic. But this would never come to pass and the plane would have a tragic future. This is the Navy's story of what could have been. The Convair Supersonic Sea Dart. In 1948, jet aircraft technology was taking off at an accelerated pace. Planes were getting bigger, flying further, and most importantly, breaking the sound barrier. Well, apart from the Navy. You see, back then, supersonic aircraft required long runways to take off, high-speed approaches when landing, and were typically unstable, the perfect opposite for landing on aircraft carriers. The Navy was still regulated to non-swept, slow aircraft, and their performance in the early Korean War left a lot to be desired. Thus, the Navy was in a situation where it was being outgunned by the Air Force, the Russians, and they needed their own supersonic interceptor program, one that didn't need an aircraft carrier. This hypothetical new jet would have to take off and land from the ocean itself, a supersonic seaplane. Thus, engineers at Convair got to work on a radically new aircraft design to fill the Navy requirements. Convair's Ernest Stout and his team at Hydrodynamic Research Laboratory thought that what if they could simply take the currently under development Delta Dagger and put it on the water? Theoretically, it could work. It would have to be watertight and the armaments would be limited, but it would do its job fine intercepting Soviet bombers over the Atlantic and Pacific. The Navy was equally impressed and placed firm orders for no fewer than 22 of the aircraft, including two experimental versions, four service test aircraft and 16 production aircraft, or roughly enough for the first Convair Sea Dart Squadron. Thus, with the green light, the Convair Sea Dart was born. Oh, oh, he oh, hello there. If you're anything like me, you get instantly distracted by everything when you're trying to remain productive. That's where the app Endel steps in. Endel is an environment-based non-profit app that takes everything we know about sound and combines it with cutting-edge technology. The result is real-time personalized soundscapes designed to help you relax, focus and sleep. Endel is informed by science, created by science and backed by science. Hey, future Nick here actually uh, a few days after using the app and I gotta say it's incredible how relaxed and like also focused I am after even just switching open the app and within like 10 seconds. I thought I would actually just say that, that I genuinely do like this app. And it's fun too. They have a new soundscape that just came out with James Blake that's going to help you settle down and get the best night of sleep you've ever had. It eases you from an evening to sleep with supportive sounds, just what I need after a hard day working in Blender on the animations that you love. And this is the coolest part, the first 100 Found and Explained viewers to click on that link down below get a free week to check out Endel. This is literally just a quick exclusive offer, so if you're one of the first people, click on that link and grab it for yourself. And plus, you'll be supporting the channel and then Endel will come back and say, we want more of those crazy machines that you animate in your videos. So yeah, you get a free soundscape and they come back for more animations. Sounds like a pretty good deal to me. Back to the show. Starting with the Delta Dagger, the engineers believed that this new seaborne craft would need to retain the same delta wing shape, triangle cockpit and triangle tail. Replacing the wheels were hydro skis that deployed when the aircraft was up to speed on the water surface and then retracted to allow supersonic speeds when in flight. It didn't have the ability to land on our runway however, but it did have small wheels to move up onto a ramp for deployment or retrieval. 
The engines were mounted on the back of the aircraft with the intakes well above the wings to prevent water ingestion during takeoff and landing. Its internals were also compartmentalized to allow it to sustain damage in the air and then not sink when it returned back to the sea. The engineers would also fit it with twin dive brakes on the lower rear fuselage that could also be used as water brakes or rudders as it putted around. The aircraft was planned to be armed with four 20mm cannons and a pack of 70mm folding fin air rockets. Pew pew! This new seaplane was planned to reach Mach 1.25 and have a range of 513 miles or 826 kilometers, enough to intercept any of those pesky Soviet bombers. When it came to the aircraft's deployment, there were three major thoughts. The first would be that the squadrons would be attached to carrier groups. Able to deploy off deck, there would be practically no limit to how many could be active at once and greatly bolster the speed in which a carrier's force could be brought to bear. The second thought, rather imaginatively, would be that the aircraft could operate from lakes across America from Alaska to Mexico. Because of its skis, it was thought that it could utilize everything from lagoons to rivers, although practically this wouldn't make much sense, it still won the charm from the public. With images of the jet taking off from the incredibly shallow tidal basin of Washington DC. The last deployment was via submarine. That's right, an aircraft carrier submarine was designed to carry up to three of these aircraft and use them for secret spy missions and rapid strikes, perhaps even nuclear. I've done a whole video on this topic, which you can check out in the description. But as far flung as these ideas were, they were never realized. You see, there was some major flaws with the Sea Dart design that would end up being fatal. Earlier in this program, I painted a rosy picture of what was thought to be the future of aerospace engineering, water skis and planes that could land anywhere. But the design was far from that. First of all, the skis were rather unstable and passed the vibration of hitting the waves throughout the airframe. They were poor performers and the aircraft needed pretty perfect conditions to get off into the air, making it practically unusable in rough weather. In addition, the team also had some trouble securing powerful enough jet engines to allow the plane not only to take off from the sea, but also reach supersonic speeds. The experimental engines used, the XJ46s, gave it sluggish performance, poor turning, and impossible handling when it got up to speed. The prototype was initially fitted with these prototype subsonic engines, and it made its official maiden flight in San Diego in the 9th of April 1953 but it wouldn't actually fit the performance requirements of the Navy. Unable to go supersonic and issues with takeoffs and landings, the Navy reduced its prototype production to a single unit instead of two, with the initial one undergoing several redesigns, particularly on those troubling skis. Six of the production models were also scaled back. Things did start to look up when the prototype was fitted with the production model of the engines, the J46s, giving it far more power. Test pilot Charles E. Richburg managed to take the aircraft into a shallow dive during one test where it actually went faster than Mark 1, finally proving that the seaplane could actually go supersonic, a record that it still holds till today. The skis were also redesigned from two on each side to a single one in the middle, adding stability and allowing it to take off in 10-foot waves, but the vibrations were still very much present. However, tragedy would strike just when it seemed that the flaws were being resolved. During a low-altitude flight test, the aircraft disintegrated in mid-air as a result of pilot-induced pitch oscillations. The test pilot, and the only pilot to fly supersonic in a seaplane, Charles E. Richburg, was killed, and his death signaled the end of the program. The Navy would pause all development and scrap the order for the aircraft by December 1953. 
The remaining half-completed aircraft were used for testing various ski concepts, with one more taken to the skies in 1955 for a single flight. But you see, by the mid-1950s, many of the flaws of supersonic aircraft landing on aircraft carriers had been conquered, and the concept of a seaplane flying supersonic just wasn't needed. It seemed that the age of the supersonic flying boat had ended as quickly as it had come. The Converse Sea Dart was a strange offshoot in aircraft development that have, could have led to many magical aircraft designs, everything from derivative versions across the world to perhaps even a civil version. There was some evidence that Sanders Row themselves, of flying boat fame, were also working on their own fighter jet design to sell to the United States and Britain that would have been supersonic. But I'm getting ahead of myself because that sounds like it's a video for another day. Today, you can find one of the four remaining Converse Sea Darts at the San Diego Aerospace Museum where it serves as a gate guard, only a few miles from where it took its first flight. The Converse Sea Dart also shares a history with the Martin Seamaster, a seaplane nuclear bomber that I've covered right here on the channel that you can go check out right now. Please do, it's got some fantastic visuals. And if you want to be part of the Found and Explained family, we have channel memberships and a Patreon, where you can see videos early, come up with ideas for our next program, and chat with me directly. Thank you again so much for watching.